Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillah Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiruhu wa na'udhu billahi min syururi anfusina wa min sayyati a'amalina ma yahdihillahu falamudhillalahu wa ma yudhlil falahadiyalah wa nashadu an la ilaha illallah wa hadahu la sharikala wa nashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh arsalahu bilhaqi bashira wa nadhira wa da'iyan ilallahi bi idhnihi wa sirajan munira amma ba'du faqad kuala Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fil quran al majid a'udhu billahi minna shaytan wajim wa'budu allaha wa la tushriku bihi shay'a wa bil walidayni ihsana wa bithi al-qurba wal yatama wal masakini wa jarithi al-qurba wa jarithi al-junub sadaq allahu al-aliyul azim we say Alhamdulillah, all praises due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator and our sustainer. We thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing us to come to the masjid for the Jum'ah Salah. As Muslims living in the society that we live in, we always have to be careful about taking as part of our culture as Muslims, part of the culture of the West. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has warned us about that. Man tashabbaha bi qawmin fa huwa minhum. Whosoever resembles a people, then they are from them. It's an indication that if it is that we are absorbed or we become absorbed into the culture of the West that we live in, we will be identified with those people under the of judgment. And we do not want to be identified with them, we want to be identified with the Muslims the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. But it is indeed a struggle being in the West and being a minority. And it's a battle that we continuously have to fight. We see, for example, in the way many of our weddings take place, that we have a lot of Western customs coming into them. Some of them may be permissible, but some of them certainly go out of the laws of Islam. One of those areas, though, that I want to talk about, which came to my mind when I saw an article concerning a woman who was mauled by four dogs in Shagonas a little while ago, is the relationship that we have as Muslims with dogs compared to the relationship that the non-Muslims have. And there is a really close relationship with dogs with the non-Muslims. In fact, there is a saying that the dog is man's best friend. And uh, you will look at, there are shows in which dogs are featured where they are talking dogs. And, you know, there are salons in certain countries where you take the dogs to get manicured and pedicured and so on. There is a real close relationship with dogs with non-Muslims. And there are some Muslims who feel similarly inclined, and it's one of the struggles we have as Muslims, not to fall into that, because our relationship with these animals are different. We don't despise dogs, as we don't despise pigs, because they are a creation of Allah, but Allah has limited our association with them. We can't farm them, we can't eat them, we can't use their hair to, uh, in the paint bushes that we would paint our houses with and so on. Our associations with them is limited, and similarly, our association with dogs are limited. So we can't love them and make them part of our lives and make them as pets as many people do. And we see that there are even shows now in Trinidad as well, where they are showing off the dogs that they have, the different breeds, and how they have been able to groom them and train them and so on. And these are competitions that people will win money in and so on. But we as Muslims have to be careful about our association with dogs. And it might sound a strange topic, but it's a topic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent a hadith that are found in Sahih Bukhari concerning it. For example, in a hadith from Abu Huraira, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Man amsaka kalban fa innahu yanqusu kulla yawmin min amalihi qiratun illa kalban harthin aw mashiyatin 
The Prophet says, Allah's Messenger, the Prophet says, Whosoever keeps a dog, whosoever keeps a dog, one kirat of the reward of his good deeds is deducted daily. One kirat, and the kirat is explained by different scholars to be like the size of Mount Uhud. The reward, the size of Mount Uhud, or in another narration, another explanation, the reward of 40 years of deeds, or just simply a large amount, a kirat, kirat, that whosoever keeps a dog, a kirat, of the reward of his good deeds is deducted, taken away, removed or reduced daily unless the dog is used for guarding a farm or cattle. Unless, therefore, the dog is a guard dog. So this eliminates for us the use of dogs as pets in our houses especially, or even if we have them in our yards, but their purpose is as a pet for grooming, for being a friend with, and so on. Of course, there are good uses for dogs which are legitimate, like there are sniffer dogs that people use in their airports and so on to detect drugs. There are seeing eye dogs that blind people use. These are permissible. And it's also permissible to have a dog as a guard dog to guard one's premises, especially in these times, it might seem logical to have a dog that you can use to guard your house, your premises, your property, or for hunting. Hunting, dogs for hunting is permissible as well. But dogs are unclean animals. Just like the pig, just like many other animals, we can't consume it. And the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when a dog licks a utensil, when a dog licks a utensil, the dog's saliva is unclean. So you see people who they have dogs licking their faces and licking their food and they're eating it and so on. But according to our Prophet وسلم, when a dog licks a utensil, then you have to throw away. You have to throw away whatever is contained in that utensil because it becomes contaminated. And one hadith in Bukhari says that the, the utensil has to be washed seven times. Of course, there are other hadith and so on, and the Hanif position is to wash it at least three times, but the point is that it needs to be washed if a dog even touches it. You know, and we, we know about the hadith as well, where the Prophet wasallam seemed sad one day. And when he was asked why he was sad, he said that Jibreel salam, was supposed to come and visit him. And then Jibreel salam, came after some time and said that he didn't come because you had a puppy in your house. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, unaware of it, searched and found the dog under the puppy under a, a, a bench or a table, had it removed and sprinkled the place with water. And therefore we know from hadith as well, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, says that angels do not enter into that house wherein there, is, there are dogs or animate pictures, pictures with faces and eyes. The angels don't enter into that. And therefore, our relationship with them is going to be different than our relationship, than the relationship others have with dogs. If a dog touches your clothing, as a licks your clothing with its saliva, you can't pray with that clothing unless you remove that saliva. If a dog touches, licks your hand, you can't pray like that, it's unclean, it's najasat, until you wash your hands, and so on and so forth. But we are allowed to have dogs as guard dogs, or to have dogs as, as hunting dogs, or even to breed dogs. It is allowed to breed dogs as well, to sell them, you know, for, as guard dogs and so on. It is allowed. But in this incident that occurred where this woman was mauled by this dog, and there were many other incidents as well, it brings up another issue. Even if we have a right as Muslims or as human beings to have dogs in our premises as guard dogs, do we have the right that they could be so insecurely kept that they could attack others? 
This woman who was attacked was living in that neighborhood. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Holy Quran, in the verse that I recited, Allah, worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, wa la tushriku bihi shay'an, do not associate any partners with him, wa bil walidaini ihsana, and be good to your parents, wa bi dhil qurba, and to your kinfolk, your family members, your relations, wa yatama, and to the orphans, well, masakin and to the needy ones, and to your near neighbors, to your near neighbors, and to your far neighbors. And some of, some of the explanation of this part of the verse is that it means the near neighbors are those who are living close to you, the far neighbors are those who are living far from you, the near neighbors are those who are your relatives, and the far neighbors, the distant neighbors are those who are not your relatives. Another narration is that your close neighbors are those who are close to you and your far neighbors are those who work with you. They don't live with you, but they work with you. You are with them every day. So they are called your far neighbors, distant relatives. But for all of them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, do good, be good to them. They have rights. And while you know, Muslims were not involved in this incident. It's good that we Muslims understand because some of us also have dogs. And sometimes we ourselves don't take enough caution with our neighbors, with the dogs that we have. And it's good for the non-Muslims to understand as well the directives and the guidance Allah has given to all of mankind. Because the Quran is for all of mankind. About dogs. And therefore, Neighbors have a right, and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in one hadith said that so many injunctions were coming from Jibrail alaihi salam concerning neighbors that he thought that neighbors would be inheritors, inheritors of the Muslims' wealth. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in a hadith narrated by Anas bin Malik says that none of you truly believes until he likes for his neighbor what he likes for himself, and therefore. We have to like, just like we like security for ourselves and peace and safety, we must like it for them as well. And in another hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, لا يدخل الجنة من لا يعمن جاره بوائقه That none, he will not enter paradise whose neighbor is not secure from his wrongful conduct from his evil deeds, from his bad actions. He will not enter paradise. So in other words, if we have dogs ourselves and we allow our dogs to be able to attack our neighbors, then that's a wrongful conduct on our part. The Prophet says, he will not enter into Jannah. So what is our position about these things, these dogs that are in this country? Because, you know, I thought about these four dogs attacking this woman. And perhaps none of us here could withstand an attack of four pit bulls. None of us. One perhaps we could fight off, but four? Why? Because they are dangerous dogs. Dangerous. And even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows us to keep dogs as guard dogs and for hunting. Should we as Muslims keep these kinds of dogs which are dangerous and it has been proven that they are genetically dangerous. They have been bred throughout the years to have certain qualities. They have the quality of unpredictability of aggression. A genetic inborn, inbred quality of these pit bulldogs is that they have that unpredictability of aggression. In other words, they can become aggressive unpredictably. They have tenacity, genetic, they're genetically bred to hold on. They don't give up. They have tenacity. They will keep coming after you. They have been bred to have a high pain tolerance. High pain tolerance. You can do them what you want, they will come back at you. And they have that ability, they have that hold and shake bite style. 
the way they attack. Cold and shake is the style that they have. And these dogs, would you believe, form part of one of three sets of dogs that were banned, that are supposed to be banned in Trinidad and Tobago. Ten years ago, it was passed by the lower house and the upper house, the Dangerous Dogs Bill. And under the Dangerous Dogs Bill, three types of dogs are identified. The Pitbull, the Fila Basiliero, and the Japanese Tosa. These, these, this, these, this body of laws has been passed but never assented to by the president and therefore never enforced. And these laws call for the removal eventually from this country of these dogs. Removal. That you won't be able to import them, you won't be able to breed them, and if, you're, if you have them and, and, and somebody gets injured, there's a fine of $100,000 and five years in jail and so on and so forth. Ten years has gone and people are still being killed and mauled and bitten by these dogs. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, there is no harming and there is no reciprocating of harm. There is no doing of harm to somebody else, just as there is no somebody harming you. But when we allow these kinds of things to happen in our own country, are we part of it or not? Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought for us true a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and verses of the Holy Quran what should be our relationship with these animals but we as Muslims are not proactive we don't we, we are reactive and sometimes we don't even react to things like these to show people in fact unfortunately some of us have these animals as our pets there is one hadith that not only says one kirat of blessings is deducted every day, but two kirats. One hadith says. How much that really amounts to, Allah alone knows, but suppose it amounts to all the good deeds we do every day, so that we do all the good deeds every day, and because we have these pets in our houses, and we don't have them as guard dogs, and we don't have them as hunting dogs, but we have them as pets, as friends, and we let them lick us, and such as and so on, all the blessings we gather in a day, they are going back out when they are deducted. So as Muslims, we have the solution. As Muslims, we have the understanding about what should be the relationship we should have with each other, with our neighbors, that it was that woman's neighbor who allowed his gate to be open, to allow these dogs to come outside to do what they did. But as Muslims, and this should be for everybody, we have to protect our neighbor's safety, protect our neighbor as well from our own wrongful conduct and from anything happening bad to them from our side. We have that knowledge, we have that understanding, we have got to put it into practice as Muslims. And we have got to let the rest of the world know that these are the laws and these are the relationships that we are allowed to have. Because there's a lot, and time doesn't permit, but there's a lot of things that go wrong in this society that we live in, in this world that we live in, when we ignore the laws of Allah, when we fall into the traps of the Western influences. Many of the diseases that plague human beings today are as a result of the presence of dogs in World War II. The presence of dogs in Europe in World War II. As a result of that, many, many thousands and hundreds of thousands of people today suffer from diseases as a result of that. And that's something that we could look into, inshallah. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that amount of guidance and understanding that we know as Muslims where our limits are. Allah has granted us a sharia. Allah has granted us a, 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 a book of laws and a system of laws that will give us happiness and success and protection and safety in this world and in the hereafter. We have got to implement it. We've got to be the first one to show the rest of mankind this is part of da'wah. This is right and this is wrong. We can do this and we should do this. And inshallah they will adopt it and there will be success and ease for them as well. Fastaghfiruhu innahu huwal ghafurur rahim. Amen.